Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the fourth and last virtual retro seminar of this term. My name is Rita Mota and I'm Dean Teza San Paolo Research Fellow at the Oxford University Center for Corporate Reputation. With me today is my co-host Alan Morrison, who is Professor of Law and Finance here at the Said Business School in Oxford, and our fantastic guest speaker, Dorothy baumann Polly. Dorothy is the director of the Geneva Center for Business and Human Rights and the research director at the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. Dorothy is an expert on business ethics and she's authored very important work on corporate responsibility, private governance mechanisms and human rights. She also has vast practical experience in the implementation of human rights standards in the context of multi-stakeholder initiatives. We are very lucky indeed to have her with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to her in a moment, but before we start, I would like to say a few words about the seminar. RETRO stands for Reputation, Ethics, Trust, and Relationships at Oxford. As many of you know, RETRO used to be an Oxford-based seminar series, and we decided to move it online because of the coronavirus pandemic. Among the many implications of this change, the very best one was the opportunity that we had to involve people from all over the world in the conversation. Today, we have an incredibly diverse audience with us from Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, and South America. I cannot tell you how happy this makes me. And it also makes me even more grateful to the people that made it possible, including Rupert Younger, director of the Center for Corporate Reputation, which is generously hosting the seminar series, Marie Watson, Chris Page, and Marquise Morgan, who have tirelessly worked behind the scenes to enable us to run the seminars online. And of course, Alan Morrison, my co-host, colleague, and mentor, without whom none of the retro seminars would have seen the light of day. Today's seminar addresses important questions that directly speak to our center's mission. Dorothy is going to talk about business and human rights in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. She's going to make the case that when corporations develop business models that meaningfully integrate respect for human rights, they are more resilient and better able to respond in times of crisis. Trust and relationships are of course absolutely crucial in this regard, as Dorothy will demonstrate. She will speak for around 30 minutes, during which time she will respond to clarification questions only. After that, we will have some time for Q&A. Please enter your questions and comments into the Q&A box and either Alan or I will relay them to Dorothy. You can find the Q&A button either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on the device that you're using. We're going to finish promptly at 5 p.m. Dorothy, thank you so much for being here today. The floor is yours. Rita, thank you so much for this very kind introduction and thanks for including me in this exceptional series that has been prepared in a truly exceptional way. I'm very happy to be joining you um, and I'm happy about the diversity of the audience. Um, this is uh, one of the big opportunities that come with this crisis that we can make uh, such lecture series accessible to a much um, broader audience. Um, I'll be sharing um, my slides with you. Um, oh. Um, so the title of my talk today is Beyond COVID-19, the case for human rights and business. Um, I well understand that on a global level, we're not post COVID-19 yet. I'm based in Switzerland. Um, here, um, the statistics are, are looking very good right now, but globally, of course, we're still right in the middle of this pandemic. Yet I'd like to invite you um, this afternoon to imagine the role of business in a global economy um, beyond um, this exceptional um, times during this pandemic. So the hypothesis um, that I want to share with you is that companies with business models that integrate human rights in core business processes will be better prepared for post COVID-19 time. They will have an easier recovery and um, a business sustainability guaranteed longer term. Of course, I won't be testing this uh, hypothesis in any way. It's, uh, it would be truly premature. Um, however, I want to give you indications and hopefully inspire um, research um, on this um, that uh, ensures that the 
um, role of human rights as in business is particularly analyzed during this time. So let me get to what drives human rights in um, uh, business operations and let me highlight three drivers. There are more, but those three drivers have become particularly um, relevant during um, the past weeks during this pandemic. Regulation, investors and trust. Let me get to it one by one. So first regulation. Um, I think it's uh, important to highlight that the need to integrate human rights in business is not new. Um, it actually started um, at least two decades ago to understand that business has a role to play for human rights. And um, many of you will be familiar with the Young Global Compact that was launched in 2000. Um, more concretely, in 2011, the UN Guiding Principles for Business Human Rights assigned an explicit role for companies to respect human rights um, through their uh, business operations. And I would have never predicted in 2011 that these soft law initiatives would become hard law so quickly. Um, there has been a clear legislation trend in the past years um, that has resulted in actual hard law in France already. It's called the Loi de Vigilance, which requires companies of a certain size to go conduct so-called mandatory human rights due diligence. There's a similar initiative underway in Switzerland, the so-called Responsible Business Initiative, which will actually come to a referendum amongst Swiss citizens um, this fall. And um, here I have a map of Europe where you can see all the um, legislative initiatives that are currently underway in different European countries that would require companies to conduct human rights due diligence. So companies um, are always looking um, what is on the legislative horizon. And clearly in Switzerland, many are currently very carefully following the conversations in the Swiss parliament about um, the uh, responsible business initiative that would make human rights due diligence mandatory in the Swiss context. And it's not isolated. As you can see, this is clearly a trend in Europe all around. The second important driver for bringing human rights into business um, operations are investors. Um, in the past weeks, I think I've I've never ever read so much about sustainable investing than in the past weeks. And um, this has been a trend prior to the pandemic. Um, already in the past years, we've seen an impressive increase of so-called um, investments under sustainable management. Um, you see here on this overview that currently over $30 trillion uh, are under so-called sustainable investment. Uh, which is a 34% increase in just two years from 2016. Um, and from a human rights perspective, this is interesting but because what it means to engage in sustainable investment uh, is to rely on so-called ESG data that gives you information about the environmental, social and governance risk that um, an investment has. And the uh, S component of ESG, the social dimension of that data, is supposed to capture human rights. Um, but uh, as we have uh, seen in a study that we conducted in the context of the NYU Stern Center for Business Human Rights, the S in ESG currently, unfortunately, uh, doesn't fully capture human rights and certainly doesn't capture human rights performance. It currently captures uh, it was based on data that is convenient together, but not necessarily data that is meaningful for assessing human rights performance or human rights risks. So unfortunately, investors right now are not very well prepared to assess um, the uh, human rights performance of companies. And uh, this is unfortunate because with the rise of ESG and the demand to um, look into ESG performance, we really need better metrics to capture human rights in the S component of ESG. And with the increased interest of investors to use ESG data, we believe that certainly um, uh, this will set incentives for companies to look harder into um, their human rights impact. Third driver, I think, is trust. And here I'll be preaching to the choir, um, considering um, this context and this audience. But during the pandemic, I've closely followed the Edelman Trust 
Barometers uh, reports uh, during the COVID crisis. And um, their first report made clear that the private sector has an essential role to play to address this crisis in an effective way. Um, the uh, second update of the Edelman Trust <laughs> Barometer um, was particularly interesting because while they say, well, the private sector has a profound role to play for, the effective, uh, for effectively addressing the crisis, they found that uh, only about 30% of the respondents agree that CEOs to date do an outstanding job in addressing the crisis. So, there was not uh, much uh, excitement about the role that companies actually played during the crisis and only 30% thought uh, they do an outstanding job. And um, as a result, I, I, I agree with the conclusion of this article, which says business will be looked at very closely in the months ahead. We can expect greater scrutiny. And I see that already happening. Um, uh, first of all, um, I I'm, might be guilty for also coining the term Corona washing. I think a lot of companies engaged in activities that were well meaning but uh, not so substantial. Um, and that became a term that was picked up by multiple uh, media outlets. Um, you may have seen that uh, company responses to COVID are being tracked. So this is just one example from uh, Just Capital um, that look at what are companies doing to address the crisis from philanthropic um, activities to uh, providing sick leaves to their employees, etc. So this is um, a, a tracking um, overview from the US. Um, but very specifically, uh, even in certain industries, civil society organizations have tracked COVID-19 company responses. Um, and here you see a list that was put together by the um, Workers' Rights Consortium, a, a civil society organization focused um, on labor rights, and in this case, labor rights in the fashion supply chain. And um, they have made a list of companies that are um, in this crisis, cutting and running, meaning um, they cancel existing orders with their suppliers and basically leave them stranded with the goods that they have already produced and sometimes already for shipment. And brands that um, uh, behave very differently and, of course, honor the contracts and do not evoke um, the force majeure um, contractual detail um, but they say of course you've already invested in uh, buying the raw materials you have put the labor in we understand you need to pay your workers so of course whatever we ordered we'll also pay for and you see those two columns and um, it probably doesn't look so great to be on the right side uh, with companies that made no commitments to pay full orders um, I try to um, uh, cluster sort of the type of responses a bit, um, the company responses to COVID. Um, I think many uh, initially said, oh, of course, uh, we would want to help and we want to give money. Um, their uh, impressive amounts have come together um, via the Gates Foundation, et cetera. Um, companies made those charitable contributions to those uh, relief funds. Others have immediately uh, figured out that they can adjust their operations and provide essential goods such as uh, face masks and hand sanitizers. And um, so they've reoriented their um, operations to the goods that are needed, that were needed the most immediately. Um, others uh, have um, highlighted that they are good employers, that they provide uh, sick leaves for their own employees, that they're flexible with working hours, considering family commitments, etc. Um, and uh, these different response strategies, I think, are, are, are not mutually exclusive. Um, some have provided philanthropic um, or charitable funds um, and uh, have given their employees uh, a lot of flexibility. And then um, two more um, response strategies, I think now um, play out particularly in the, in the um, fashion industry. Um, we've seen those transactional responses where companies said our shops are closed um, in the markets where we sell our goods. So we are also stopping all orders and we're cutting um, uh, off our suppliers uh, versus uh, a, what I would call a relational response where um, uh, of course, brands said um, we uh, 
honor our relationships with our suppliers and understand that um, uh, they need us more than ever um, during these tough times. So we will do our best to honor our contracts uh, instead of canceling orders. So these were just different responses. Um, some clearly um, worked in parallel, but um, uh, most importantly, I would like to tease out from those different responses, the impacts on post COVID-19. How do those different responses impact uh, or affect uh, the recovery and the long-term business success of those um, companies. And of course, at this point, these are largely speculations. I have some anecdotal evidence that I'll tell you about in a minute, but uh, I'm keen for someone to do research on this also because I've invested many years in identifying business models that allow profits and principles to coexist. Um, and I want to give you one example from the garment industry um, that we've identified prior to COVID, but in a way COVID is a good test case to see does this alternative business model actually hold during a crisis? So um, as I mentioned before, um, in, the, in the fashion industry context, um, there are different brands that have different types of relationships with their suppliers. Um, one model I would call rather transactional, um, where often orders are given to the supplier um, with the lowest um, bid, uh, so the cheapest price. Um, uh, versus a different model where brands commit to sourcing from the same suppliers over a longer period of time, invest in those suppliers in terms of uh, training, uh, management training, improving, their, helping to improve the productivity of the production facility, um, but also providing um, training for um, compliance with labor rights. And uh, it is, uh, we have seen that in the context uh, of Bangladesh's garment industry for human rights, um, those longer term business uh, commitments make a huge difference. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's an entirely different way of engaging with your supplier. And uh, I wanted to know if during this crisis, um, the brands that have established those so-called strategic partnerships with certain suppliers, if those strategic suppliers are actually also treated differently and hopefully favorably um, during these uh, very tough times. Here you see a, a table that compares uh, the different types of business models in the fashion industry and the purchasing practices with suppliers. So on the left side, you have the typical transactional sourcing model, which I think is the dominant um, sourcing model. On the right side, you see characteristics of the partnership model. And in this case, I've used um, the uh, Decathlon as uh, an example, Decathlon is a French sports retail company, currently the fastest growing sports retailer in uh, globally, I believe, but definitely in Europe. Um, and you can see that um, some of the differences I already highlighted clearly apply um, to Decathlon and that they're probably on the extreme end of forming partnerships. Uh, I've uh, now interacted with a lot of fashion brands that claim to have partnerships, but it still means a lot of different things to different people. But Decathlon, I would say, have, uh, has, is very committed to true partnerships and that they actually make business plans with their suppliers at last at a minimum five years. They don't want to engage with suppliers unless they have a five-year commitment to grow together, as they say. Um, they say, ideally, we want to work with our suppliers for more than 20 years, but they start out with a five-year business plan where they never negotiate prices, which is very, which is the common way of interacting in that industry. They don't negotiate prices because they say it doesn't add value. We want to instead do uh, transparent costing uh, of uh, every order. We want to un understand your business and um, help you to become more productive. And at the same time, also engage with you so frequently, uh, often they actually have uh, Decathlon stuff in uh, the factories, um, to also make sure in parallel that um, workers' rights are systematically respected, not just at the day when maybe uh, an auditor shows up. It's for them a, a condition of engaging and a condition of, of doing business together. Um, and I've seen this um, as I visited uh, Decathlon factories in Ethiopia last spring. Uh, 
So I've seen this in action and I've seen that compared to the many other garment uh, factories around, the turnover rates were significantly lower in the decathlon factories, which I think is a strong indication that also workers were um, happier uh, and more satisfied with their jobs. Um, often wages are a sticky point in those relationships and um, in Ethiopia there's not even a legal minimum wage, just a, a common entry wage level, which is at $26 a month right now. It's the lowest in the world and a wage that no one can survive on. Um, and in the case of Decathlon, I've seen the business plan where rising wage levels were built into that business plan, understanding that of course this entry level wage is not sustainable. Um, it will go up and uh, Decathlon also engages um, with the ILO in, uh, in conversations around how to set a more realistic um, and legal minimum wage. So um, the, the results from the Decathlon case are really encouraging. And uh, I think they show that um, you may know Decathlon, they have very competitive prices, they're growing fast, um, but the way how they engage with their suppliers um, is very different um, from what I've seen elsewhere. I think there are not many other companies that are so focused on this relationship model, um, which, as they say, reduces risks for them, reduces risks um, that as a branded company, you probably don't want to take uh, anymore in a time that is um, increasingly, uh, during times where transparency is just a fact of life, every worker has a cell phone and uh, human rights violations just don't um, look good for your corporate reputation. And um, Decathlon clearly says they also believe that um, if labor rights are respected, these are just better run companies they were dealing with. So they're keen to improve productivity and labor rights in parallel um, because they've had those um, good experiences with them. So now during the crisis, I reached out to Decathlon and said, so how is it going with the suppliers um, and how have you reacted um, to uh, your suppliers? It may have noticed on the list earlier, Decathlon doesn't appear. Decathlon is a family run company that is notoriously bad at communicating. Um, I think it's a strategic decision that they just want to stay out of the limelight for the time being. Um, but they were very openly shared the communications they sent to their suppliers during this time. Um, a, a French company, uh, often those messages weren't polished English, but the tone was uh, right in that they reinforced the interest in going through this crisis together. They made clear this is a challenge for both sides. Um, they highlighted that exceptional times require exceptional um, uh, decisions. Um, they gave uh, suppliers a lot more leeway in ensuring that um, they can pay their workers, um, that they can sell the goods that were produced elsewhere, but assuring that, of course, they would pay for existing orders. They gave them an outlook on when they could re, um, reinstall production, um, that clearly uh, reinforcing a commitment to continuing business together as soon as um, the situation improves again. And um, uh, it's, uh, of course, a, a way of, uh, it's a way of communicating between um, allies rather than uh, just distant business partners. Um, that truly impressed me. I also engaged with H&M over this. Um, H&M, in a similar way, uh, says that they would restart business with their so-called strategic suppliers first. Um, H&M says, well, it didn't look, uh, I mean, I have to take their information sort of for face value, they say they have around 70% of their suppliers in their supply chain are so-called strategic suppliers, and they would be prioritized um, as soon as they can uh, give out orders again. Um, they've also uh, committed to pay for existing orders. Um, and to me, these are early indications that um, the trusted relationships um, in this uh, supply chain model and through those purchasing practices are more robust during a crisis and those companies that um, um, are uh, treating those relationships well during a crisis will also be ready much quicker again to pick up uh, as soon as shops open again, as soon as consumption levels rise again. So I think for the recovery, um, this will truly uh, facilitate um, things in a major way.
I don't want to sugarcoat, however, that the fashion industry was one of the industries that was probably hit the hardest um, during this crisis. This is a McKinsey report that highlights um, that um, there had been a dip of almost 30% um, due to the crisis. And they estimate that by the end of the year, um, probably a large number of those fashion brands might be in serious financial trouble and might even go bankrupt. Um, so I don't want to under, um, uh, yeah, under, I don't want you as the audience to underestimate the e immense economic pressure that those companies are under. Yet, even in those tough economic times, um, some companies stick to um, their business model because they believe it's better business. They don't only do that because they think it's the right thing to do. They clearly also do that because they believe this is the way um, to do better business. So um, I just want to conclude with um, you know, another notion of why I believe these type of business models we need to investigate further and explore further. I'm not saying that Decathlon is the perfect company. I just think they have built in human rights into the way how they do business in a, a way as systematic, uh, better than I've seen uh, anywhere else before. Um, the, uh, the notion that I think is becoming louder and louder, uh, at least on my Twitter feed, is um, that civil society organizations are keen to push for building back better. Um, here, um, I have a link for the so-called principles for a just recovery from COVID-19. I think these are uh, things that mostly civil society organizations are putting forward. Then next to it, you see the theme of the next World Economic Forum in Davos 2021 in January, which is called the Great Reset. One could argue this is sort of the vision of a largely business-oriented audience. Um, and then on the right, you have um, the quote of an EU commissioner, Didier Reinders, the EU commissioner for justice, um, who uh, thinks that responsible uh, business should become the norm. Um, and he already committed to creating regulation at the EU level that um, would um, make human rights due diligence mandatory for every company operating in the EU. We are not quite there yet, but I think these are sort of the landmarks or the, 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 the uh, mileposts for um, which business now needs to navigate. And I ha I'm under the impression that the world works in favor of companies that um, anticipate those developments, that are ready, um, irrespective of whether the regulation comes through and how strict it will be, irrespective of that, companies that are uh, ready to meet potential regulatory requirements, uh, companies that are meeting expectations from civil society, they will be better positioned um, in a post-COVID global economy to recover from this crisis, but also to ensure longer-term business success. So with this, um, I hope I've given some food for thought for the academics um, in the audience. I hope that um, you'll be inspired to um, investigate further as this, as time moves on. It's clearly premature and I only have anecdotal um, evidence um, for the need to integrate human rights for the sake of better business. Um, and uh, I invite uh, questions. I'm looking forward to interacting with you. Um, if you want to um, stay in touch with me, I have a Twitter account as well and um, feel free to also email me. But I think I'll hand back to Rita um, to facilitate the Q&A part of this session. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Alan, would you like to start with some questions? Sure. Thank you, Dorothy. That was a fascinating talk. And uh, questions are starting to appear in the uh, Q&A box. So if you have them, please type them in. Uh, Ian Munro has a question um, which relates to uh, the sort of business case for human rights that you're um, promulgating. So I'll read it out. He says, many firms whose business models have benefited the most from COVID, 
like Amazon and Facebook have got business models with a questionable relationship with important human rights, particularly yeah. the rights to privacy and the rights to unionize. Yes. Given that those are rather important, rather influential business models, what issues and problems does this observation pose to the sort of win-win approach that you appear to be advocating? Um, this is a fantastic question. Um, so first of all, I'm not propagating a win-win approach. Um, after all, we're talking about human rights. These are universal norms. I don't think it needs this business case to justify why human rights should respect human rights. But um, in corporate practice, uh, I think it's very helpful if conditions can be created that allow profits and principles to coexist. So it's just a pragmatic um, position that I have here where I think we need to um, uh, do more research on how to facilitate that business case. Um, again, it's not um, uh, for the justification of human rights, it's not needed. But in corporate practice, and I think I've, I've seen and worked in corporate practice for long enough, I know that to make sustainability claims of companies truly sustainable, ideally, there is also a business case, at least in most cases, not always, there might be a situation where tough trade offs are necessary. But building human rights into business models, I think is a way to make um, the respect for human rights truly sustainable. The companies that um, uh, were mentioned, Amazon and co uh, have clearly are winners of this crisis. Um, they do have business models that are not aligned with the commitment to human rights. But I think exactly now is the time, I mean, you've noticed the fact that um, these companies are not aligned um, with any systematic respect of human rights or the way how they do business. So that fact alone shows to me that now there is greater scrutiny on companies that haven't aligned yet. Um, and now is the time to ask them to do so um, and to do better. I think we have momentum here with civil society asking for just recovery with a business community that understands that the new normal may not be the old normal. And um, also regulators that are responding to an ever louder demand to um, rethink the role of business in a global economy. So I think it, it's, there's momentum for a more fundamental reflection on the role of business. And we should use that to ask companies that cannot in any systematic way show yet that they're respecting human rights to do so. So the next question is actually related. Um, Usman Malik is asking about Amazon again. <laughs> and uh, the question here is whether uh, Amazon and companies like Amazon uh, can act as a catal catalyst for change, um, especially in light of the increasing, increasing, increasingly prominent role that they're playing in the, in the context of the coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic. Um, and Usman is suggesting that Perhaps these companies could implement some sort of mechanism to, to sort the types of sellers that were allowed to sell in the global north so that only those, those sellers that respect human rights are allowed to sell in this context. Um, Usman, I like the suggestion. <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, indeed, if a company like Amazon would create a model that prioritizes or sets incentives for companies to systematically look into working conditions, for example, um, that would be a game changer. I mean, I think compared to GDP, the revenue of Amazon is probably now, uh, it's among the top 20 economic entities in the world. So they have incredible power and leverage. And if, uh, if they would take this on, this would be a major game changer. They could develop a model and set incentives for a different way of sourcing from developing countries where governments are not um, protecting um, basic human rights as they should. I think that would, that would be huge, yes. Um, uh, I'd love to work with, uh, in case someone from Amazon is on the call, I'd love to work with them and help them to get, the, to get there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm the guy who keeps asking questions from former speakers at the same seminar series. So we have one from Laura Spence, who is at uh, Royal Holloway. 
And, oh, uh, Laura, I know her well. Hi, yeah. Laura. Well, unfortunately, she can't speak directly, sure. but she does I, some terrific talk and thank you. So, um, she also wants to ask you about your thinking on being bad at communication and asks whether you thought about the value and even the suitability of different kinds of communication. So she says, um, if a business is clear with its direct business partners, isn't that good? And do we really need them to communicate to more distant stakeholders? Um, it might be useful for others, but um, Laura's yep. asking whether it's necessary. Um, excellent question. I think I would agree with Laura in that the external communication is least is less important most important clearly is doing it in your business operations and communicating with your uh, suppliers the right way <coughs> however i do believe that if you operate in contexts like ethiopia or bangladesh no actor can alone can address those systemic challenges in that supply chain so a certain level of transparency and also exchange with your peers i think is absolutely necessary i think um what decathlon has developed is an insular approach i think they have built wonderful relationship with individual factories that um, provide slightly better conditions or more agreeable conditions to workers but they are not addressing the systemic issues in that business environment. So I think it's important that in such environments, companies engage in what I would call multi-stakeholder initiatives um, that jointly want to address those systemic issues. For example, the fact that in Ethiopia, there's no legal minimum wage. I'm happy that Decathlon is now engaging in those uh, conversations, but they're fairly new to that. <laughs> um, uh, in, in Bangladesh, as you know, since Rana Plaza in 2013, many brands have uh, come together to address factory and building safety. And I think it's important that um, brands understand that they need to work together and, and pool resources to address these systemic issues. Um, alone, they will only be able to create islands of compliance. And even that is a major um, pool. So I think collective um, action is necessary and for that a certain level of external communication and collaboration uh, is necessary. That Decathlon currently is one of the worst companies in the transparency, um, in the, what's called the transparency index, transparency uh, fashion, transparency index, uh, I think is less concerning. Um, this is, um, that, that only measures sort of the glossy CSR uh, reports that um, I think are less meaningful than the actual relationships that I've described. <laughs> Great. Um, so I have another question here from Yuri Mishina. And Yuri is asking, to, to what extent might these reactions be based on purely rational calculations? So Yuri is wondering if the ones that behaved in a very mercenary manner might have done so because they have a lot of power over their suppliers and their customer and, and their customers don't care about how they treat their suppliers. While the ones who have tried to have a win-win with their suppliers were, were more susceptible um, to these types of concerns. Um, not sure if I perfectly understand the question, but I I think the question is about motivations, like why do companies behave in a certain way? And I'm not, I don't want to dissect those motivations. I think they are always mixed. Um, there's sort of a notion that uh, you want to do the right thing, but you also want to do the right thing because it's probably better business. So uh, clearly uh, in the case of Decathlon, um, the uh, the motivations are mixed. Um, they're driven by an interest in growing their business and they just understand that growing their business requires uh, delivery reliability with their suppliers. They, it requires certain quality um, of the products. It requires also the right prices, clearly so. It requires certain skill sets from the workers that produce the goods and um, taken together, I think it's a, it's a composite um, calculation that those companies make. Um, but there are certain companies like Decathlon that have arrived at the conclusion that it's actually better business to engage with suppliers um, uh, on an 
equal eye level rather than top down, just sending them what they're supposed to be doing um, because just the business doesn't work so well. And also longer term, they invest more time recruiting suppliers, figuring out where orders have gone lost or why the quality wasn't right. And all this experience um, has sort of led certain companies to say, we want to rearrange our purchasing practices. I think for that run of plastic also was a wake up call um, because um, it, it was one of the largest industrial accidents in history. Over 1,100 workers lost their lives as uh, this factory complex um, collapsed. And uh, it has shown that transparency into your supply chain is a condition for managing the risks in that supply chain. And for that, if you want to know where your stuff is being produced, you need to have closer relationships with your suppliers. I guess a related question could be what, what role do customers play in motivating corporations to adopt, adopt this type of model? Yeah, indeed. Um, that's the favorite question of my students typically. So they want to know what can I do as a consumer to set those incentives? Um, I think uh, the conscious consumption niche is growing, but it's still a niche. And Unfortunately, the attention span of consumers is rather short, even after Rana Plaza, the, the brands that were, whose labels were found in the rubble weren't uh, hurt longer term, <laughs> um, although briefly they got really bad press. But um, I think just waiting for consumers, which is a very heterogeneous mass to make the right decisions is... Um, um, not targeted enough. For me, the investors as drivers are um, more focused on human rights performance. And that's why I think it's so urgent to figure out the S in ESG, because that's what they base their decisions on. Um, and with this new uh, or accelerated interest, um, thanks to COVID in ESG data, I think now is also the time to figure out better metrics um, for assessing the S. And I think this needs to be done in an industry specific way and the NYU Stern context be piloted um, better metrics specifically for the fashion industry. What constitutes good purchasing practices? Um, and uh, so we have started thinking about, yeah, better assessing human rights performance rather than just procedural aspects of human rights due diligence. Okay. Uh, we, we have a question from Donna Brown, who's kind of picking up on the S in ESG mean question. Um, she says that um, we don't all necessarily know exactly what we mean by human right. Um, mm. It's quite a specialized subject. Yeah. So, you know, it might be the right to be paid for labor, the right to a family life, the right to bargain collectively and so on. Yeah. Um, she, she would like to know, I guess this relates to the question of how one measures the S in ESG. Are these things respected? Um, equally across the employers you've been looking at in the garment sector? Um, and if they're not, how do we weigh them up one against another? Mm. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question because unfortunately, this concept of human rights due diligence is not an end in itself. Um, in fact, I think it requires further operationalization to truly understand what kind of human rights expectations do we have of companies that operate in very specific industry contexts. So that's why I believe those metrics need to be uh, specific for industries. Um, in, uh, as I explained, in the, in the garment industry, clearly labor rights and global supply chains may be the most uh, prominent human rights issues to address for a company operating in that industry. But as a company in the tech sector, an ICT company, a, um, a social media company, the, hum the greatest human rights risks are very different. They relate to right to privacy, right to freedom of expression that need to be addressed primarily. Um, so that's why I believe it's important to not um, stop at the human rights due diligence concept, which still leaves a lot of room of interpretation. Um, and I'm actually very uncomfortable with companies filling the substance of human rights due diligence individually. I'd like to have industry standards by which we can then also hold corporations to account. 
Um, so for me, the human rights due diligence is to get together and maybe in a multi-stakeholder initiative to then define those concrete industry standards and the metrics by which we can measure human rights performance. Because indeed, as uh, Donna has pointed out, uh, human rights um, play out very differently in different industry contexts. And um, I'm not comfortable with companies picking and choosing what they would like to work on under the label of human rights due diligence. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Annette Mikes uh, from Said, and she's asking um, about Okay, so she's saying that in her work, uh, when she talks to firms about climate risk, for instance, um, she often hears companies saying that the law precludes them from accepting lower returns. And so they cannot invest in sustainability uh, because they're worried about the bottom line. Um, and companies that do this need to have ownership structures that allow this, and it says. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, is the fact that the Catalan is a family owned firm important to to make the business model work in terms of sustainability and human rights yes uh, very good observation i do think the ownership structure matters and in the case of decathlon helps because it's a family-owned business and if the family decides to do things differently they can um, they are not accountable to uh, shareholders like others um, and they have from the outset, a longer term business um, definition um, and perspective. But um, you may be familiar with the decisions that Paul Paulman made while he was the CEO at Unilever. He abandoned quarterly reporting um, because he argued for the long term sustainability plans that he has for the company. It's counterproductive to report on a quarterly basis because he cannot show on a quarterly basis, the financial bottom line results for this. He's been harshly criticized for doing that. Um, but uh, I think abolishing short termism is necessary to implement a longer term business objectives. And I would say sustainability broadly is clearly a longer term business objective. Um, There's a question here, which comes from um, someone who um, is attending anonymously which is actually very pertinent in the light of um, the Black Lives Matter movement, which is on uh -huh. uh, our screens at the moment, asking to what extent you consider diversity and inclusion a basic human right. Mm. And if that's the case, um, how should corporates and institutions address institutional racism, particularly in Europe, where it's more subtle and less overt than mm -hmm. it is, um, for example, in the United States, perhaps? Uh -huh. um, like with business and human rights that I would like to see become fully integrated in the way how businesses work. Um, I'm not a fan of res company responses that now again use their charitable arms um, for uh, let's say anti-racism um, campaigns or, or, or organizations. Instead, I would like to see companies adopting a diversity strategy that is real. Um, with um, clear commitments to a diversity in their own governance structure. <laughs> um, so instead of, again, just outsourcing it um, to others, I think they can make change themselves by a diversified board um, uh, or a diversified stakeholder engagement. And I think companies haven't done enough yet to, to get there. Um, in Europe, I think there are major issues with gender um, inequality to start with. Um, in the US, um, only very few um, Fortune 500 um, companies actually have um, um, black CEOs. So there's still a long way to go where companies themselves can actually change inside out um, in engaging in, in uh, issues that have now um, been put in the spotlight um, against uh, pandemic that I think has um, these these problems existed before, but they've really pulled back the curtain on inequalities that have become visible like never before. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Dorothy. We have another question here, an excellent question from Maureen Kilgore. Um, and Maureen's question is about the firm as a political actor, and she's wondering what your thoughts are 
on the relationships between governments and businesses, uh, as many governments have used the pandemic as a chance to violate human rights, for example, by suppressing collective bargaining rights, uh, rights to privacy and movement. Um, and Maureen is wondering if, as far as you're aware, there are any examples of businesses that have expressed concern for these types of threats to human rights that come from governments. Mm, the observation is uh, spot on. I couldn't agree more. Um, can I think of good examples where companies have sort of stepped in and say we, we're not supporting this? In the context of some pandemic, no. But in the context of, let's say, tech companies that have uh, advanced facial recognition technology that they could sell to repressive governments but decide not to. I know of cases that where that has happened where actually big money was left on the table because out of principle they said no we cannot engage um, with governments that would use our technology um, to suppress their own citizens for example. So um, in, in well, some parts of the world, indeed, the government is not protecting human rights, but it's part of the problem, or maybe the biggest problem. And um, I think multinational companies also have a chance to use their leverage to not um, facilitate uh, repression. Okay, a related question comes from somebody who doesn't identify him or herself. Uh, but whoever it is, thank you for a very enlightening talk. <laughs> and says, uh, may says, an interesting point. Um, they point out that in the wake of the 2008-9 financial crisis, mm -hmm. we heard talk about banks and financial institutions uh, reforming themselves, and the extent of reform arguably has not been profound. Mm -hmm. And um, the question is whether this is likely to be the same, or whether we're going to see business as usual after a year or two. Um, so is there any reason to believe that we will actually see substantial changes post COVID or are we just going to you know, go back to normal? <laughs> um, clearly we have momentum right now and uh, we should use this momentum to ask for um, fundamental change um, in ways that we probably haven't seen after other crises before. I think the, pandemic um, is different in that it's it's global to start with. It affects everyone. Um, and uh, it will probably last longer. Um, and um, I can imagine that company, some companies may bow under the economic pressure and go back to a very narrow understanding of their business. But for longer term business, um, success, I believe companies are better positioned to put in place forward-looking business models, which include respect for human rights, um, the environment, and um, all the societal demands that have been made um, in the past years, because this is what's going to be expected from them um, also soon legally. So it's just becoming a new frame in which business needs to operate, I believe. Of course, it's still speculation. Um, I think the more persistent we are, the greater our chances. <laughs> Dorothy, we have a question here from Enrico Fontana. Um, and he thanks you for the enlightening presentation and says he has a very brief and practical question about suppliers in the fashion industry. Um, Enrico thinks that the case of the Catalan is fascinating, but he's worried about the fact that these suppliers, uh, such as the ones in Bangladesh, uh, generally sell to multiple brands at the same time. And um, he's currently speaking with local executives in Bangladesh who say that half of their buyers are committing to maintain their orders, like H&M, but another large half uh, has not committed to doing that yet. Um, and because of that second half, uh, these suppliers are struggling to pay their workers, especially after Ramadan. Uh, and so how, how, do, how would you account for the variability of buy, uh, buyers' behaviors and how does that affect the, the bigger scenario? Yes, so clearly Enrico is an expert. <laughs> so um, uh, he, uh, uh, that's fantastic. So I would say that in Decathlon's case, it's a bit different because to, is to, Commit to those five-year business plans requires that Decathlon is by far the biggest buyer in those facilities. 
which also comes with risks, clearly so. But typically, a, stra a strategic partner of Decathlon means that Decathlon sources 80 to 90 percent uh, of the production capacity is filled by Decathlon. That gives them the leverage to also truly influence the conditions. Clearly, there's a risk because the supplier becomes almost 100% dependent on Decathlon. So there is an understanding that either we grow together or we fail together. Um, in, uh, in the context of Bangladesh and other companies, yes, H&M doesn't always have more than 50% of uh, filled uh, of production capacity. Um, and there are many other buyers in the mix and not all are as committed as H&M or some others. That is indeed a problem. Um, and uh, um, Brands like H&M have done so for the sake of diversifying their own risks. Um, but now I think they can see that this is uh, not beneficial if, it's, if, if they actually want to support their suppliers to survive in such a crisis. H&M um, told me that they have increased the order volumes in certain facilities for the sake of uh, filling uh, projection gaps that others left um, to make sure that the supplier survives and can pay their workers. So they do have sort of the economic situation of the supplier um, in focus when they make those decisions um, and they try to balance things out and probably increase um, the engagement with certain suppliers for the sake of making them survive. That's what I heard. Thank you. Almost out of time, Dorothy. I'm going to ask you one more question. We're going to have to ask you to answer it briefly, and it's quite a big question. It comes from Matt Amangual, who says, nice to see you again. Hopes it's in person next time. And his question is, what's your view of the ILO-led for call for action jointly with unions and large brands? Mm -hmm. um, while, soft, while soft on commitments from brands, it recognises the structural response that's needed to respond to this crisis. But the statement wasn't mainly about rights but rather about politics advocating for specific policies and actions from international organizations do you have any brief thoughts in the last five minutes on that brief thoughts yes um i think it's uh the, they have the right instincts to get together it's a bit like after rana plaza it was the, in an unprecedented move the industry came together and created uh joint initiatives to address building and um, fire safety in Bangladesh. Now in this crisis, again, I think it's great that there is an interest in coming together to address the crisis. But of course, in under the framework of the ILO, nothing is ever easy. It's often complicated. It takes time. So I'm watching closely and uh, I wonder if they actually get to real action and uh, are able to raise funds and agree on a way forward because of course with the unions in the mix um, this compromises and consensus will be particularly um, difficult um, so I'm watching it closely and I hope that they arrive at something that is actionable yes <laughs> but the instincts are good coming together and uh, addressing systemic issues Perfect. Thank you for being so brief. <laughs> um, I think it's probably time for us to say goodbye. Um, thank you so much, Dorothy. This has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we've all learned so much and uh, I have a strong feeling that many of us are going to leave here today inspired to keep learning about human rights in business. Um, I have to say that it's a, a huge personal privilege for me to be here today. Your work informed my thesis. Uh, I've been a, a, a fan for a very long time, so thank you again uh, for coming. And I would like to apologize to everyone whose questions we didn't have time to, uh, to ask, but we will make sure that Dorothy gets all of them so that she, she has an idea of what was in your minds while we were uh, having this seminar. Uh, Rita, thank you. Uh, Ellen, thank you. And the team, thank you. This was really fun. I've done a number of webinars, but these were all excellent questions and I enjoyed the exchange. Thank you very much. Um, thank you from me too. It was a really fascinating, enlightening end to our seminar series for this term and for this academic year. Let me just close with a couple of remarks. Firstly, I'd like to thank Rita. Thank you, Rita, for all the hard work and energy you've devoted to the seminar series since it's um, inauguration it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't done all that and secondly thank you to our audience for coming along every two weeks to participate in a webinar um they really in, even though it's been typed into the question and answer box the questions have really enlivened the series
we will resume the retro series in the autumn, but we don't know yet whether it's going to happen in Oxford or in cyberspace. In either case, I hope to welcome a, a lot of you back. Um, but that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.